have so many topics in flipped mini lecture number 13 that I've written them out here. First topic will be Newton's first law and Galilean relativity. So the ancients thought that things always wanted to return to the earth as one of their properties. And they thought that things that were in motion tended to slow down. Upon closer examination, both of these things are somewhere between completely wrong and kind of wrong. The things want to slow down is actually completely wrong. Things only appear to want to slow down due to friction. And the typical friction that, say, if I toss a ball uh, in the air would be the friction of air resistance. But if I'm sliding something across a surface, it would be the friction against that surface. In the catalog of forces that Knight has made, we have an F drag and we have an F static against surfaces and an F kinetic against surfaces. And these are the things that forces that make things want to slow down. And if it weren't for those forces, things in motion would tend to remain in motion. And that is basically the statement of Newton's first law, that things in motion tend to remain in motion, and things that are at rest tend to remain at rest. And I say tend to, well, unless something is acting on them. And if nothing is acted on them, then the precise statement is, in the absence of any forces, things in motion remain with that motion continuously, and things at rest stay at rest. Now it turns out, though, that there's only a certain set of reference frames for which that works. If you're moving in steady motion, like on a train playing ping pong ball, and there's not any windows on the train, and the train is a perfectly smooth train, you can play ping pong on that train perfectly without even being bothered by the fact that your train might be going at 100 kilometers or 200 kilometers down the track. But the moment that train takes a corner, even if it doesn't speed up or slow down, the moment that train takes a corner, you will discover that your ping pong game is affected. Or if that train starts to slow down to come into a station, you will again see that your ping pong game is affected. And so for an observer that is accelerating around a corner or an observer that is speeding up or slowing down, for those observers, it seems like Newton's first law doesn't work. So there's a set of preferred observers for whom Newton's first law does work. And those observers are moving continuously with no acceleration relative to one another. So one way of defining what an inertial reference frame is, is to say it's the frame in which Newton's first law works. So this stuff is insanely deep, actually, and it takes a long time to learn to appreciate. But there's really no like math to do as a result of it. So read 5.6, and then we'll cover 5.7. Free body diagrams. Again, not much here, unless, of course, you're doing them wrong, in which case there's a lot here. The way we draw a free body diagram is we draw the particle as a point, and then whatever forces there are acting on the particle, Let's say there's n different forces on the particle of different lengths. Who knows? Some of them are short, some of them are long. We put the tails of each of those force vectors on the particle, and that makes a free body diagram. So make sure you know how to draw free body diagrams the way Knight has you draw them. And by the way, although there are some things that Knight has you do and that's the way Knight has you do it. This stuff, the, these business about free Dirati diagrams and always putting the tails of the force vectors on the particle, this is something that all physicists do when they draw free body diagrams. So look in particular at the examples on page 124 and 125, the stop to think box on number 5.5 .5 at the bottom of 125, and then you're done with chapter five.
and then resume with me with 6.1. So now I'm covering 6.1 and 6.1 Knight calls the equilibrium model. Uh, when you're hanging out with engineers, they call this statics. In the equilibrium model, the usual situation is that all the particles are at rest. So if you enter a room, no matter how things are arranged, unless there's something going on in the room, like a fan is turning, if you enter a room, usually everything in that room is at rest. The bookshelves are at rest, the chairs are at rest, the file cabinet's at rest, the whiteboard is at rest. These things though are not at rest because there are no forces acting on them. These things are at rest and staying at rest because there's no net force acting on any of them. These things though are not at rest because there are no forces acting on them. These things are at rest and staying at rest because there's no net force acting on any of them. And actually the forces acting on them can be an extremely complicated set of forces. And if you're a structural engineer, you really need to master all that stuff. So this subject that engineers call statics is actually an extremely important subject because well, a lot of the time things aren't in motion. So if things are stopped and, and continuing to be stopped, then not only is their position unchanging, but also their velocity is unchanging. And so that means that their acceleration is zero. And if we have the formula that for every object in a room, that F net equals M A, and we now know that A equals zero, then the entire subject of statics is basically the subject that you get by trying to solve the equations when F net is zero. Now we already have a fancy notation for F net. F net is the sum, I equals one to N, of F sub I, where there are N forces on the object in question. So statics is the job of, and it's non-trivial, of finding all the forces in play, but where the sum of the forces on each object adds up to zero. Knight has some examples of that. And you can look at them on pages 132 and 133. And then we'll get to the last topic. So the last topic of this lecture is using Newton's second law. We're going to really get down to brass tacks now. Because we've been trying to gain some conceptual understanding of Newton's second law. But now we just need to solve it in a bunch of different situations. And Newton's second law was that F net equals a. Now this is a vector equation. That means that it has to be true for every component of the vector. If we're in a three-dimensional problem, F net has an x component, which we call, write as F net x. F net has a y component, which we write as F net y. And F net has a z component, which we write as F net z. And meanwhile, well, m is just m, a number, but a is also a vector. So a has an x component, a has a y component, and a has a z component. So if you're in three dimensions, this tidy little equation actually represents the system of three equations. If you're in two dimensions, this tidy little equation represents this system of two equations. And if you happen to know for some reason or other that the particle can only move back from forth on a line, then you'll be down to a nice simple thing like f net x equals m a x or f net y equals m a y, but you won't have to do both of them simultaneously. Well, we're not quite done on using Newton's second law because this f net x is a bit of a mess itself. Remember that f net is the sum of all the forces on a particle. So that's sum i equals 1 to n of f sub i. So what's f net x? Well, this itself is also a vector equation. So f net x is the sum i equals 1 to n of the 
I forces X component. And of course, F net Y is the sum, I equals one to N, of the I forces Y component. So in practice, you tend to say MAX is equal to the sum of FIX and MAY equals the sum of FIY. And notice here I have stopped putting I equals one to N. It is very, very common for a physicist to just say, hey, yeah, it's the sum of all, all the forces F sub I and to leave off the fact that I runs from one to N just because it gets boring writing that all over again. And so this is the form which you'll very often end up applying Newton's second law in. And at this point, I think it'd be great if you went through in detail uh, Knight's example 6.3 and make sure that you understand the forces on the toad car, the free body diagram for the toad car, and the application of these two equations, which he's not going to actually have you solve yet, but he, the first thing he wants to make sure is that you can set up the equations. And taking a 6 through 6-2 is plenty for Friday. And then following that, we're going to actually get more serious in 6-3 and 6-4 about gravity and friction.